Sheffrin. Hey, how's everyone doing? It's Rich Sheffrin. <laughs> and uh, hopefully you can hear me. Let me know if you can. And also, if you're watching this, which if you're hearing this, you are, um, then by all means, please say hello. Let me know where you're watching from. My name is Rich Sheffrin. <clears throat> I own a company named Strategic Profits. Um, we've been coaching online business owners how to grow their businesses for the last 20 years. We've worked with people like Russell Brunson, Ryan Dice. I coached them a long time ago. And most of the names out there that you recognize would probably somehow stem back to Strategic Profits in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I do these live streams every Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesdays from 2 to 4, and Thursdays from six to eight. And I do these really to kind of stay in touch with the market, to let me know what you're struggling with, and therefore let me help you with whatever you're struggling with. That gives me information about the market, and it gives you the opportunity for me, uh, someone who's been coaching for about 20 years of online marketers and business owners, and someone with a great track record to give you advice. And um, I have testimonials, billion dollar testimonials from companies like Agora, and uh, I am the real deal. And so with that said, we are broadcasting right now live on Facebook, on YouTube, on LinkedIn and Periscope. At some point, we will add Instagram to the mix and uh, kind of a sparse crowd today, especially compared to Thursday, which is kind of interesting. Um, so uh, let's see, guys. Um trying to think about what I can share with you before we kind of dive into the meat. I uh, got to see a demo today of uh, something that my team's been working on for quite a while. And uh, it was a demo of a new site. I don't want to go into any more details than that. Um, it's related to our products and stuff like that. But uh, I was blown away and I was really happy with it. So I am in a great mood. My girlfriend, Kim, is in New York right now. She's up there kind of getting one of her houses in the Hamptons uh, kind of renovated a little bit in the next couple of days before uh, her new, uh, before another Airbnb person stays there. Um, so let's see, what else? I see the comments are coming in now, so that's cool. And, uh, you know, what I want to talk to you guys today about is the recognizing, first recognizing, then strategically going about and creating the reputation that you want that helps open doors for you in whatever direction you want to head. You know, I, I find that most people don't think strategically about their reputation, right? And they kind of think of, excuse me. <laughs> They think of reputation and personal branding as kind of the same thing, and they're totally different. Uh, personal branding is the what you project out into the world. Uh, reputation is what others say about you. Oftentimes, they can overlap. Sometimes, they can even be identical, but they can often also be pretty far apart. And, uh, you know, I... Uh, I've taught I've taught stuff in the past, especially since I've had so many guru clients that I've helped kind of position that part of the transition from being an expert to being a guru is that more often than not, an expert is paid for what they do. Um, that's what kind of sets the price point for a guru for a person that has built a brand around themselves and their skill set and what they bring to the table. Um, they are now no longer paid for what they do. They're paid for who they are. And so that is one of the biggest kind of pivots, you could say, in really, if you're going to have any kind of info publishing business, you really want to kind of facilitate, cultivate a reputation that would be conducive to someone who gets paid for who they are, not what they do. And, you know, I would be lying to you if I said that how that all the things that I've done 
to get me to where I am have been uh, have been strategic or purposeful because they haven't. Um, but what I can tell you is is that in reflection, looking at what I've done um, and where I am today, uh, a lot of those things that were haphazard, that were impulsive, that are just maybe the way I am, turned out to really work in my favor and therefore kind of illuminate a path of the the of how to go, how to do this, how to how to build a reputation that um, precedes you, that opens doors for you. Um, you know, one of the fascinating things uh, for me when I first got back online, when I first got back online after taking, uh, you know, five years off and starting to reach out to people about Steal Our Winners, um, you know, obviously I was going to reach out to the people I've coached and I expect them to remember me. But I also uh, reached out to people I never met who I admired for what they've done and some of them more recently than when I was around. And uh, I was really kind of blown away at how many people knew me, how many people would be willing to get on the Zoom call with me with no idea of what the hell we were going to talk about. And, uh, and that is what has helped me in so many ways, in so many times, in so many places, with so many different businesses. And the if you think about the product of steal our winners i'm not was it intentional that you are not streaming through your personal profile today i'll get to that uh dr volgerman um if you think about steal our winners which you know for those that don't know what steal our winners is we it's a digital mastermind of sorts you could say where we deliver eight plus strategies and tactics that are currently crushing it that the world does not know about um, and we have over a hundred contributors to that. And, you know, the, one of the first questions I get from people who are, you know, people I meet, whatever are, they tell me, like, they ask me like, well, why would they give, why would people tell you something that's currently working really well that no one knows about? Like, why wouldn't they keep that to themselves? And part of the reason is the relationship and reputation I have, right? And there are very few people who could pull that off. And yet um, the rep my reputation and my connections are a big force in that. And so as I was reflecting and thinking about like stuff to share, it kind of occurred to me of, you know, just like a lot of strengths, right? You don't, you're not really, they're not present for you because they just come naturally to you right? Uh, I've never thought, I think of myself as an introvert, uh, and I am an introvert. So therefore, networking is generally a foreign concept to me. But at the end of the day, I have built a reputation and I've built a network that serves me in a phenomenal way. And that even though nothing I've done along those lines, for the most part, has been intentional, um, it nonetheless what probably reconfirms even more so of why it's a strength because here I am and I didn't focus on any of it. So with that said, I want to kind of unpack that for you. And as I was looking at it and as I was thinking about this idea, right? Like how do you build a reputation that literally pays you and pays you ongoingly for the rest of your life, a reputation that allows you to command a much higher price point in anything you do, create, or sell. A reputation that opens doors for you. A reputation that gives you the ability to get almost anyone, not anyone, but almost anyone on the phone uh, or through to someone. A, and that that when I started thinking about that, when I started thinking about that, right, a reputation that pays you, uh, how to go from being paid for what you do to who you are, I think the first thing that might seem kind of counterintuitive to this, that might seem out of place, is that 
you really need to define what success is for you. Because if you're going to uh, be intentional about both how you project to the world, right, your personal brand, and the reputation that you want to have, what people say about you, it's a good idea to know what success is to you, like what's a life well lived, so that your projection and what people, your reputation are both in alignment with fulfilling on that definition of success. And I can assure you that if you've never taken the time to truly define what success means to you personally, no one else, it's not something you write to share with people. It's to be clear to you of like, what does it mean to live a life well? How will you define success? Um, and when you have that, when you know that, when, you, um, when you're clear on that, then intentionally building your brand and reputation uh, makes sense. And, uh, you know, there are, there's a, a famous line or statement that came from a, I believe the writer is Bansky, um, or movie, or I don't know, but I've heard the line. And so I found it before we went live today. And here's the quote. I mean, comma, right? Like it actually says that. I mean, they say you die twice. One time when you stop breathing. And a second time, a bit later on, when somebody says your name for the last time. And uh, I would say when someone says your name with positive regard for the last time, right? Um, so there's the time that you die, and then there's the time where your impact has died. You can kind of think of it that way. And, uh, and I like that as just a quote not as a definition of success or anything like that, but as a quote, as a way of thinking about life, that there are people, like I once heard, I'm not a religious person, as many of you know, even though I was, uh, I went to yeshiva as a child, um, but the, like, one person who I once was speaking to, and I'm going to butcher this, so I apologize in advance for butchering this, because it was so eloquent the way that it was said to me, and I'm not going to convey it eloquently at all, but the gist of it, what, what I can convey is the gist though. The gist of it was, is that, you know, uh, basically heaven and hell, another way metaphorically of looking at that is how you are perceived in the lives of others. Um, so if people want to hold on to thoughts of you in a positive regard, that's heaven. And if people hold you in negative regard, then that's hell. And I'm talking about after you pass, right? Um, and I know people who thought they had figured things out, like their life really mattered. And when they passed away, uh, it was so clear to everyone, never them, that their life really did not matter as much as they thought that life went on in every which way that the person was hardly missed. So I think thinking about that and what's your definition of success, right, is uh, critical to this whole thing. Because if you're going to build, you know, this transcends just business. This is you in every facet. And I really, truly believe that if you aren't, if you, you can certainly live your life as a good person. I think everyone should. And, but if you have ambition and you want to get to a certain place in life and you recognize that, especially nowadays, but it always was the case that your reputation precedes you nowadays, is just easier to find and therefore more like out in front. But if you recognize that your reputation precedes you and you have certain goals in your life, then why wouldn't you work on your reputation to help facilitate the completion of 
your definition of success, of success, your goals. So with that, um, we'll wrap around. I'm not really sure how we're going to play out the rest of this live stream. I've got some notes that I can refer to. Um, I also have recorded videos in the past about this. So I'm tempted to start one of those videos, which, you know, were more, much more thought out than when I hop on these live streams. Um, for most of the live streams, you know, I'll give some thought to it beforehand, but I, I don't, when I say some thought, I'm talking about like 15 minutes, 30 minutes in my journal from time to time. But, you know, I'm not focused on like at many hours of prep for this. So whereas like what I would share would be. So Stephen is on YouTube. Hey, my man. Uh, Daryl is in Florida. Good to see you, Daryl. Uh, and let's see. Can I, I won't be able to see it from there. So um, John is in California. Hey, John. And Adam, good to see you, my friend. And Renan in Brazil. Thank you, Renan, for commenting on the um, commenting on the YouTube videos. And while I'm doing these, actually, let's just see if I can. When I change this, does this change? Let's see. Yeah, cool. I can stand up for a second. Different angle this time. Uh, cool. All right. Hello from Brazil. Uh, hello to the real deal, Rich from Coronado Island. Hey, Dr. Vogelman. Uh, happy days are here again. Nairobi, Kenya. Nice, Stephen. Uh, hey, Rich. Tuning in from Huntington Beach, California. Hey, Peter. Uh, Dynamo Foe. Hey, Rich. Hello from Dublin, Ireland. Great to see you live. Always enjoy the replays. Thank you, as always, for sharing your expertise so willingly. My pleasure, Dynamo Foe. And I can tell you that I've been consuming a lot of of Irish material currently because Conor McGregor is my favorite fighter. The, the, from the other view, the thing on top is uh, Conor McGregor's glove uh, that he signed for me. Uh, well, it was signed and someone bought it for me. Uh, didn't sign it for me. But uh, so I've been consuming all the content with about the fight that's coming up this coming weekend. Was it intentional that you are not streaming through your personal profile today? When we, I don't really know what the reason is, uh, Chris, but um, Matt, like whenever we stream through all these channels, like uh, for some reason, it was pulling the personal one into like the group or something like that. And the challenge with that was then there wasn't much activity on my, I guess, my fan page, I think. And so Matt, because this was really a Matt call, Matt did not want it on my personal page for that reason. Although I have, you know, um, for the longest time, I like friended people that I don't really know. So there's quite a few people on my personal profile, but that's why um, if you have the chance, Dr. Vogelman, ask Matt. Hey, Jason in Tampa. Good to see you. Uh, I totally gr agree on having a clearly defined personal definition of success. It's not six figures, seven figures, or eight figures. It's about being able to eat fig newtons whenever and wherever you want. Well, I think you can do that already. It's a question of eating fig newtons whenever and wherever you want, as often as you want, while still staying thin and in shape and feeling good. I like the positive regard versus negative regard viewpoint. Cool, man. Hey, Rich, keep rocking, man. Thanks, Cam. And thank you for being here. And thank you for the comment that you made somewhere as I just recently came across. Um, hey, Julie, and you're welcome. And playing a video might provide some great talking points. That's what I thought. By the way, you take... On your take on Alfred O. Oh, Adler was phenomenal. I got the book you mentioned. Cool. Well, you're, thank you. Uh, what up, Milos? When are we talking? Uh, Julie in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Nice. Good day from Melbourne, Australia. Rich, what's better to come across as totally different to your prospect or totally in sync with your prospect? It depends. I, the ideal, if you're asking me what the ideal is, the ideal is that the, your story, your narrative intersects with them, right? That you were once where they are now and where you are now where they want to get to. 
that is the ideal. So you're not the same anymore, but at one point you were where they were. That allows you to speak exactly to the problem. So people feel like this relates to me, this guy gets me. And it also points to you having the solution since you're not there anymore. And so I would say uh, that would be the best approach. Uh, Glenn from Highland Beach, my neighbor. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, do you think there's such there's such a thing as too much free content to a point where it would devalue your paid content because people feel like they get enough for free? I guess uh, that is always an issue, Cam. Um, you know, the difference is is that like what I do at the price points that I do it at are very different than what I do here um, and what I share here and. You know, I guess if I'd been doing this for like one or two years, um, then I might run out of content or might have to cannibalize like the really like the stuff that I sell. But nowadays, that's really not an issue for me. And I feel like uh, there still can be too much. There's no doubt about that. And at some point, um, at some point, I will evaluate like, do I still want to do two of these a week? Do I want them to be two hours? Um, and we're almost at a point uh, company-wise that we have the editors, uh, video editors and everything that we need in place. And so part of doing these live streams, really, like the bigger reason is to one, like connect with people and grow audiences, which is something that this has done for us very well. But the other reason is for video editors to take like a two hour web live stream like this and cut it up into an edit. So like cool one minute pieces, cool five minute pieces, cool 10 minute pieces and populating those all over the internet, right? So this is supposed to be the raw material that the video editors can use to do that. And for me, if I can do this and be, I enjoy doing this, right? So this is easy for me, much easier than it would be for me to kind of just come into this room alone and record just <laughs> to the camera by myself, right? Instead of doing that, um, doing this, and hopefully because you ask good questions, I give good answers, the editors have everything that they need. Uh, I like Conor McGregor too, man. Awesome. Hope he wins this weekend against Poirier. I think he will. He generally, uh, he generally, well, like at least the Nate Diaz one showed that oftentimes he can make a mistake in how he prepares and then he comes back prepared differently. If you haven't bothered to think it out, as you call it, why should I bother to give you my time? Explain. Are you, are you asking me that? Are you asking me, how do I pronounce your name, Phil? Is it like short for Phyllis? Um, Phil, are you asking me to tell you why you should bother to give me your time? And if so, I will gladly answer that. Just let me know if that's the question. Hi, Rich. I noticed I get sometimes emails from Matt with free value, tips and mindset. And my question is, does he have, does he have a specific free pitch value pitch ratio he follows? If that would be, it shouldn't be more free value than pitches. So you don't burn your list. What's your thoughts? Um, I don't know if Matt uh, follows a specific ratio or not. I also think that, I don't think there's any set formula. Um, obviously all pitch all the time, not ideal, but it also depends on how you pitch, right? Like a lot of, like a Ben Settle style email, there's a pitch every day, but it's embedded in stories. And so you're being entertained. And so with that, um, you can pitch every day, but, you know, straight pitch, no. And, um, and even when you're giving value, there should be some form of call to action as well. So uh, you'd have to ask that, Matt. You'd have to ask Matt directly. I heard it's best to do Facebook Lives on your biz page, but who knows? Well, if so, then that's probably another reason why. Uh, I've been consuming a lot of Irish material as well in the form of Guinness. I didn't know that you were such a beer drinker, my man. Uh, hello, just had a nap. I love naps. I'm a dream weaver. 
<laughs> well, I'm glad that you had a nap and that you're well rested. Uh, hey, Lisa in Miami Beach, good to see you. And Jonathan Crabtree, you're welcome for whatever you're thanking me for. If I was where they were and they want where I am, should they also be similar in personality type, etc.? Well, should they be is really not the best question to ask. Will they be? Yeah, they probably will be. Um, you know, one of the things that was interesting is, and it makes sense once you kind of think about it, but one of the things that was interesting to me was that, um, hold on, I'm just moving this, was that so many of the, you know, we used to have my coaching program uh, in module two, we had Colby built into our platform and people would take the Colby test and we would share the, their results with them. And a very large number of clients had a similar Colby profile to me, which in one sense you could say, Oh, that's a coincidence. But is it really? Because like, it's obvious that I think in one way out of many ways, and um, it's not too shocking that the people who would buy my information would be people who think like I do or have a similar style. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, it, Pat, if it was, um, if people had kind of similar personalities, but personality might be too general, um, maybe thinking style, maybe ways of communicating, stuff like that. Uh, lost you. Isn't this on YouTube? Where am I? You're on Facebook, Lizbeth, but we are on YouTube too. Uh, how important is theming your niche? Guys, sports themed, alpha dog theme, good to do it, or should we just Keep the info product professional. Depends on the info product, depends on the niche, right? Who is the audience? But in general, a theme generally will never hurt you, especially if it's tied to benefit, you know, in some way, shape or form or in identity. Uh, Milos, can't wait to chat. I went through some new therapeutic trainings that could be really interesting to share with you. Very cool. Looking forward to hearing about it, my man. Uh, how do we go about finding good video editors? I don't trust anyone. Do it myself is such a, it's a time suck. Yeah. Well, what you have to do is uh, you got to test them out. But like at least the way that people, it was done here for me is that we have one good editor here in the States who gets it, right? Um, who kind of understands the aesthetic that I like. And there's been a bunch of videos where the aesthetic has been not what I like at all. And um, so we have that one person here. Then that one person here hires other video editors in the Philippines for us, right? And their job is to manage all of the Philippine video editors, but to, you know, to do the first level thinking about it and telling them what to do. So that's kind of the path, but uh, that is how we're doing it. Uh, your live stream content creation is such a great way to rapidly create those pithy value bombs. That's what I thought. That's why I've been doing it, but we haven't had the video editors and everything else in place yet. So, um, so that's why I don't want to make any changes until we get that rocking. Um, Matt's idea to stream to your public figure page is actually a smart strategic movement. In my case, my personal page is better than my business page. Well, I was doing it on all pages, but for some reason, like when I went to the group, it was my personal page or some, there was some kind of thing like that. I only drink four Guinness per month. Clearly not a big beer drinker. Okay. So then you're not cons consuming that much. Yes. It wasn't a complicated question. Was it? Uh, no, it wasn't, but, uh, okay, Phil, um, why should you listen to me? Well, um, I was the original coach of Russell Brunson who started click funnels. I was the original coach of Ryan Dice that started digital marketer. I was the original coach of Todd Brown marketing funnel automation. Um, people like Ryan Levesque and every, and pretty much every person out there that you could name have bought my courses and gone through it. I invented the automated webinar. So anytime you've ever seen an automated webinar, that was my idea, that was my design, and I wrote a report about it and laid out the formula for it back in 2007. 
I have uh, many people in the direct response world know Agora Publishing. They are the largest and most successful info publisher in the world. Uh, I have a billion dollar testimonial from them. I helped them grow their sales in one year over a billion dollars. Um, I've generated over $15 billion in increases in businesses. I was the first online business coach that ever existed. I wrote a report called the Internet Business Manifesto that went viral um, and was downloaded over 2 million times in the first couple of years. I wrote it 15 years ago. Actually, June of this year was the 15th year anniversary. Back in 2007, I wrote a report called the Attention Age Doctrine 1 and 2, where I predicted that the number one scarcest commodity online in the future would be attention and uh, and explained what the consequences of that would be for entrepreneurs, for marketers, and uh, society. In three months later, I wrote the Attention Age Doctrine 2, which talked about uh, that I figured out where people's attention was going to go. It was going to go to this new thing called social media. You have to remember that this is pre-Facebook. This is pre-all that, right? This is when Google still, uh, there was still Google video. Uh, like they had bought YouTube, but they still were competing with themselves. Um, so I did that. I also, that in 2007, in those reports, I predicted that there would be a rise in authorities in every market because of the uh, explosion of choices. So then the next report I wrote was with Jay Abraham. The two of us wrote it together. And it was all about how to become an authority in your market. We created the first how to be an authority in your market course. And it was me, Jay Abraham, and Gary Vaynerchuk. And, uh, you know, Jay and I have been behind more personalities, him offline, me online, than any two people on the planet. And so I wrote the Maven Manifesto. So that's just a little bit of what I've done and a little bit of the reason why you should listen to me. But I'll give you another. I have a product called Steal Our Winners. Steal Our Winners is a kind of like a virtual mastermind where we deliver each and every month eight plus or you know eight or more uh, strategies and tactics that are currently crushing it online that the world does not know about yet. Now, why is it important that the world doesn't know about it yet? because things work best when the least the number of people know about it. Uh, as more people use it, the, the results go down. So these are things that are not in courses or anything like that. Because of that, we have over 120 contributors now. I end up talking to the best of the best each and every month about what's new, what's working. And so I am the most plugged in person online. That is why you should listen to me. And, if, and I would stack my past and my results and what I've done online with almost anyone, no, with anyone that is hireable for advice. How about that? So generally, uh, Phil, I am not someone who likes to kind of toot their horn, but you asked and that's my answer. And I don't think very many people stack up Hey, Rich, thanks for these calls. I'm still finding it hard to choose between a job or a business, thinking that I'm losing my desire for starting a business if I don't start now. And an idea for a business in which industry, since I have many ideas all the time, how can I narrow it? Well, so there are many ways to narrow it, but, the, but you know, there's, there's a very big difference, obviously, between starting a business and having a job. Um, if you're not sure... What I would suggest is potentially get a job in one of the businesses in the type of business that you'd most like to start. When I left the music and fashion business and, you know, it took a year off, then I had decided I wanted to open up a hypnosis center. When I decided to open up a hypnosis center, knowing that I knew nothing of running a hypnosis center or any medical office or anything, I found the only person that had a hypnosis clinic at that time, like not a hypnotist, but a hypnosis clinic with multiple hypnotists. It was Patrick Porter in Virginia Beach. I called him and told him that, you know, I was a successful businessman in New York that I had built a couple multi-million dollar businesses. I was interested in coming to work for him that my intention 
was to open up a hypnosis clinic in Manhattan and that in order for me to know whether that's a good idea or not and to understand this business a little bit, I will, I'm offering my services to you. In fact, I'll even pay you. And I don't remember if I paid him $5,000 a month or $10,000 a month to work for him. I'm not suggesting that you do that. But what I can tell you is the reason that I was able to build that hypnosis business into a $13.5 million business in under four years was because I learned 10 years worth of knowledge for the three months that I lived in Virginia Beach and worked in his offices. All right. So, um, so one of the ways uh, to understand the business is get a job in that kind of business. The other, though, is to see if you like the business, right? To see if this is your cup of tea. I mean, apparently, if there's some reason you can't decide right now, there are some question marks. All those question marks can be answered by working for someone else in that same type of business. And so that's what I would suggest at first, even like, look, I didn't care when Patrick hired me, what he was having me do, right? I was going to put in those hours. I was going to hang out there even when I was not on the clock, right? And knowing that I'm bright and intelligent and I can make stuff happen, uh, that it would only be a matter of time until he started to share more with me and wanted me to help in different things because I'm smart. So that's how I did it. And I... If you ever have the opportunity to work in a business that you're thinking that you have no experience in that you're thinking about starting, it is very wise to do. There are invisible things in every business that are there, but you don't know they matter until you have your own business. Uh, you're right. Perhaps not personality, but values, thinking style, even same weaknesses, of course, overcome somewhat. Thanks for the Colby reminder. My pleasure, Pat. Uh, have many ideas in many industries. Some require a long-term time and money investment to get it going and some shorter ones like online marketing. The goal is like on any long-term thing is to figure out how you can cut that up. What is the shortest, most incremental like step that could be taken that then puts it in like that you can put in front of the market that you can get some feedback like the worst thing to do is to build something big over a long period of time, have a release, and then realize that it's not what anybody wanted. Life is way too short to waste your time building things that nobody wants. So what you have to do is you have to figure out, like, how do we get there incrementally? What is the smallest step? And if there isn't one, then you really got to consider whether this is the right project for you or not. Um, I would say based on your level of experience, based on your questions, right, that I'm just making some assumptions here, that playing a long game kind of thing is probably not the best approach for you based on the, the amount of experience you have, Cheryl. So I would say that unless you can figure out a way to make it much more kind of incremental, uh, minimum viable product kind of thing, minimum viable funnel, minimum viable everything, uh, and really kind of suss out the market, then probably you shouldn't do that project. We've had a great food blog editor in North America. She is our secret weapon. Very cool. Would you like me to share this on my business Facebook group? Do I get brownie points? Nobody's there, LOL. Yeah, well, it's still nice for it to be shared, Elizabeth. So sure, share it and put hashtag shared, right? And uh, didn't mention that, but at the beginning, but if you're watching this on YouTube, please give it a thumbs up, comment, and most importantly, subscribe. If you're watching it on Facebook as well, please emote and comment. Uh, all of the platforms use algorithms based on engagement level and activity level to determine how many people to show this to. So you help me by being engaged and commenting and subscribing and doing those things. And most importantly, if you can share it, and if you share it, please put hashtag shared in the, uh, um, put shared in the comments and uh, this way I can give you a personal shout out. Thank you. Uh, with regard to Phil's question, Rich has such a wealth of experience and ideas. He can go more than 24 hours nonstop in a live stream. I've seen him do it. Yeah, I can do it for 48 hours. Do you own a Gore or an equity partner? No, no, I'm, I'm just a 
lowly employee, an outside employee and worked for them for 17 years, like as an outside consultant. But um, no, no, actually, a small piece of Agora is being sold right now for three billion dollars. So, yeah, if I was part equity, I would be getting a nice sized chunk of that three billion. Uh, and I am not a billionaire, not even close. <laughs> By writing these doctrines, did you monetize those? How do we do this? Yes, I did. Um, every every free report I wrote was a perspective, a way of seeing the world. Um, either what was currently going on, like attention was going to become the scarcest commodity online, like a shift in context because context determines behavior. Um, broken windows theory, things like that, right? Like you can, if you change the environment, you can change the behavior inside the environment. Uh, you know, nudge and uh, behavioral economics is all about that. Um, for other reports, it was more focusing on like what mistakes people were making and the what I believe was the right approach and why. And then maybe a month later or two months later, I would be selling a course that fit like hand and glove, right? Like it fit exactly those beliefs. So if you read my free report and you agreed with what I was saying, if you had epiphanies and you were like, ah, now I get it. Then when that product came out, which I told you would be coming out in that report, I said that, you know, I'm working on something right now that, you know, whatever. Um, and so, yes, the least I ever made on any report, I think, was like two million bucks. And um, the Internet Business Manifesto has made me tens of millions. Um, appreciate the response. Cheers. You're welcome. Uh, please, Rich, I have a great opportunity for Gary Vaynerchuk. He never responds to my inquiries. He only responds to my texts every once in a while. So uh, don't be offended. He, I bet you he doesn't respond to most these days. Uh, CLR Winners is phenomenal. If you haven't yet, why not check it out? I might have offended Phil. I might have. I don't know when. Appreciate the response. Cheers. I don't know if the cheers was like a legitimate cheers or cheers like saying goodbye. Uh, Rich is a legit marketer with tons of credentials. Uh, this is a legit business that was doing millions a year previously connected to Open Table. Very cool. Uh, what was the previous? Uh, let's see. All right. Well, uh, the summary will definitely give your video editor something good to work with. Yeah. Uh, I think the real difficult question is why should someone not listen to Rich Shepard? LOL. Thanks, man. What was your background in hypnosis? Um, well, so what happened was is that I had decided that the music and fashion business really wasn't for me. So I got out of that, took like a year off. Might have been longer. Like I just was taking time off. And I uh, read an article in Time Out magazine about this hypnotist in New York. She still operates there. Her name is Julie Flanders. And uh, there's an article about her. And I had never been hypnotized. And so I wanted to try this because I'm a curious person by nature. And uh, I went and got hypnotized. And I happened to be highly hypnotizable. And because I'm highly hypnotizable, I had a profound experience. And so then I kept going back. And then at some point... Um, I got so fascinated by it, I decided this is going to be my next business. And so then I started studying hypnosis, I started taking hypnosis classes. I studied NLP first with Doug O'Brien and John Bandler. I mean, John Laval, then a little bit with Richard Bandler. Then I also worked with another bunch of other gentlemen like Kenrick Cleveland and uh, et cetera. And so... I took a lot of trainings and hypnosis from like Jerry Kine and uh, George Vienne and um, thinking of who else, probably a bunch more that I've forgotten at this point. I apologize for anyone that I have forgotten. Um, and then I opened up uh, at that time a hypnosis center with my girlfriend at the time. And um, it was just me and her. I did all the hypnosis in the beginning. I did all it was hypnotherapy and um got certified all that stuff and uh very quickly realized that i was never going to be the world's best hypnotist so recognized that my strength is my business ability and my marketing ability and so quickly kind of removed myself from the hypnosis role started hiring hypnotists then we created a training school for hypnotists etc but um that's my background and built the single largest privately owned hypnosis facility. We had 60 full-time hypnotists on staff. 
um, had tens of thousands of clients, had offices in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. And uh, yeah, it was cool. And we ran full page ads in the Daily News, far front, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday. Wait, Rich was a singer or a fashion fashionist? I was a, I, my store created lots of trends. So you could say on the fashion side, yes. Like we were the first store to bring diesel into the United States. Um, Dolce & Gabbana shopped at the store all the time. I knew them. Giorgio Armani shopped at the store. Calvin Klein shopped at the store. Um, the designers for Diesel shopped at the store. If you worked for the company Diesel, Renzo Russo, who is the owner of Diesel, made it. If you if you flew into the United States, you had to sh stop at our store because it was our his favorite store in the world. In fact, my manager became president of retailing for Diesel. And um, so the store was like no other store in the world. And I've actually played videos of this store during some of these live streams. Uh, I was not a singer, but um, the we I built a recording studio in the middle of the store, um, an electronic music recording studio that turned out to be one of the best. Like we bought every old piece of equipment that you could. And uh, then pretty much anybody who was anybody at that time in electronic music that was in the city would stop by and record stuff. And um so we had a techno music label and then that went uh, worldwide and that was when electronic music was really in. And then that was very much tied into the store because the store catered to like the club and lounge life. And um, then when I decided to exit the clothing business, I also exited the music business. And uh, so I did like, I would say that I was actively engaged in the world of fashion for a while. Uh, but, uh, but, um, not, not a singer. I have no music ability. Zero. I played piano when I was a kid at clarinet, but I can't hold the tune. I can't dance. I can't sing. I am a triple not threat. <laughs> uh, I believe in being generous. I share what I feel is good content in whatever field. Well, that's good. But you know, your audience probably is not as interested in all of those things as you are. And, um, you know, that can backfire. That can backfire. Got to be careful with that. Should I write for Agora? Copywriters for Agora can make millions of dollars a year in royalties. I guess I missed the 48-hour marathon. No, I've gone 48 hours. I never did the 48-hour live stream. I still want to do it. And I wanted to do a 50 hour live stream this past March 13th when it was my birthday, my 50th birthday. So maybe now I'll have to wait till next March 13th and I'll do a 51 hour live stream. I don't know. Uh, Phil Rich is the real deal. Uh, he may not be as famous because I classify him as an intellectual marketer. And for whatever reason, intellectuality <laughs> impedes popularity. I highly recommend reading his free notes on his Facebook page. Thank you, Usama. Uh, I just started a new company in the middle of hop, hoping to launch soon. We're focusing on helping others become entrepreneurs. It is something I've done all my life. That said, this is my first online only biz. I am having trouble deciding between doing a webinar or a challenge to start. Challenges seem like a lot more work, your opinion. Um, challenges are a lot more work, but they're also much more effective right now than a webinar would be. So there is that. In addition, if you wanted my advice, like specific, uh, I would say do the challenge and, and roll up your sleeves and do that extra work because like, okay, Craig, like even though, right, like we originated the automated webinar and people would come to me and say, I want to create an automated webinar. I would say to them, well, first, you just got to do a webinar and because you're not going to go through the trouble of automating something until you know it works. So just do a webinar and record it and we'll see how it goes. So it's not as easy as you just record a webinar and you're done. If you think that odds are is if you want to have a highly dialed in webinar, you're going to have to do it multiple times. You're going to have to do it, look at the transcript, tighten things up look, have others' opinions. Like, unless you happen to be naturally gifted as a salesperson, that's totally different. But there are very few people who just can do a webinar and be done. It takes some significant tweaking if you really want to dial it up, and you probably will. 
have to. Um, challenges, and that assumes that you understand your market, you know what turns them on, you get everything, right? Um, whereas with a challenge, because it requires that like face-to-face, -face, even though it's online, uh, it's really putting you in touch with your market. And, you know, I tell people this all the time, and I think they get it, but uh, if the single greatest um, advantage that a coach, well, I'd say the single greatest advantage that a marketer can have is coaching the same people that he's trying to market to or she, right? As a coach, in order to maximize the help that I can give someone, I can only help the person as much as they are open to sharing, right? So in order for me to ma give the maximum help, people have to be pretty open and transparent with me. If they're paying me to coach them, I don't know why they wouldn't, right? So when you, know, when you read your standard marketing book and your standard marketing book says, what keeps your prospects up at night? The average person can't answer that. If you're a coach, and you're coaching the people that are you're going after, and you can't answer what keeps your prospects awake at night, then I don't know what kind of coaching you're doing. And I, I don't even know if you should call yourself a coach. So from that standpoint, I think doing the challenge will give you a taste of that back and forth. It's, people aren't going to get as open and real with you because it'll be a little bit more public maybe, but you're still going to get insights that you will not have unless you actually um, get belly to belly online. And look, man, like Craig, like even to this day, when we do a promotion, uh, we were just doing an after analysis on when we did, like one of the things that I've always done in my past, we'll probably do it for this campaign too, is contact non-buyers, offer them something and ask them to tell us why they didn't buy. Like, where did we, where did we mess up? Like where, what were the reservations you had or the objections you had or, you know, why didn't, why did, wasn't this appealing? And when we do that, um, even though I'm good at what I do, even though I've been in this game for a really long time, even though I've helped companies make a ridiculous amount of money, pretty consistently, there is an objection or there's an issue that never occurred to me that I thought was handled, that didn't even need to really be addressed, that like was significant. So my point is, is that if I can still learn when interacting with my marketplace, then I would imagine you can too. And you're not going to get that learning from a webinar. You're going to get that learning from challenge. And on top of that, a challenge is easier to sell right now. And uh, when you've done a challenge correctly, it should be relatively easy. It's one of the easier ways to get people to ascend and buy a more expensive product. Really nice discussion today. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, if you tie your company closely to yourself or brand, do you face special challenges when selling and exiting the business? Like, does it create an earthquake when you leave? When you leave, unrelated, spent a half an hour earlier today exalting the Internet Business Manifesto to the woman who runs my marketing. The UU diagram blows my mind to this day. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, it's. Uh, you know, I just came across. I think I. Uh, thanks, Adam. And uh, Adam was a client of mine a long time ago. And uh, back when he was just a freelance writer, I, I believe that's correct. Now he has a freelance writing company where he has a head of marketing. So apparently he's not just a writer anymore, but this is the U diagram. This was the front of the manifesto that people created posters of and put it up on their walls and stuff. Um, but uh, and the most financially successful diagram that I ever have drawn in my journal. That's for damn sure. Um, so to answer your question, Adam, the, of course it does. Uh, it does make it more difficult. However, it's also a lot more easy. It's a lot easier to grow a business on a personality than a brand. It's a lot easier for a personality to be remembered in someone's head than a brand is to be remembered in someone's head. It's a lot easier to form a relationship with a person than a brand. Over time, you can with a brand, but it takes a lot of repetitions and it takes 
just takes a lot. And, um, you know, the best of both worlds is to have many personalities in a business that therefore is not dependent on any given personality. So that's how you, if you want to grow a business the easiest way, you grow it off the back of a personality. If you want to get free of that business, you then add more personalities to that business until the primary personality is no longer the majority. So for me, uh, my goal is for strategic profits to outlive me and to and for me to recede in the bag as it grows and have Matt take more of a forward position and uh, for us to have other gurus as well. Um, you know, I've had my time in the sun and it was great and it was wonderful when like in 2006, I was really well known. Um, but if that never happened for me again, I'm, that's totally okay. And uh, I just want to have a positive impact on the lives of entrepreneurs online everywhere. And I want to have a company that makes a difference in those people's lives, whether or not I'm the focal point of that company or not is kind of irrelevant. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, I love it. Like when I, when I see something that my company has done that I haven't been involved with that I really like that makes me proud or is clear. There's something I could never have done myself. Um, so anyway, but yeah, the, the ideal is to like, Optimally, you build the business based off a personality that grows into a multi-personality or transitions into a brand, right? Like ClickFunnels is a brand, but Russell Brunson was well known for a lot. For the first couple of years, a lot more people knew Russell Brunson than ClickFunnels. So he leveraged himself for ClickFunnels, right? And I would say the same thing with uh, Ryan Dice, right? Like in the beginning, Dice was much better known than digital marketer. These days, digital marketer is the brand, right? So you can transition to brand once you've gotten enough momentum. And then you have the best of both worlds. I would say that we never fully got there um, with strategic profits. Like my name always towered over the brand. Um, so, which is unfortunate, but whatever. Um, but this time around, I think we'll we'll get it right. Uh, I love the fact that you were in the brick and mortar world before becoming an online business maven. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the same at the end of the day. Uh, that business model is similar to what we're doing, except we were couture betting, partnering with great brands, some obscure. Cool. Uh, triple non-threat. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Amen. Mary Barnett, you seem very happy in that, uh, in your avatar, um, with the thumbs up. Very cool. That is why my info is segmented according to interest marketing. Got it. Have you yet? To, of course I do Facebook ads. Setting up a branded YouTube channel. We have. Oh, you've yet. Okay. Well, so. Got it. The webinar would take them to an upsell such as a master class. I have to create the content still. So thanks for answering. And I'm about to become an Amazon bestselling author. Trying to tie in and align my business to the book. I know if you brand yourself to the business instead of developing the business to be sold, it makes a difference how you start out. But the book in my name and the business not in my name, will I be able to get people to tie? Yeah, you'll be able to get them to tie it all together. Um, um, well, Craig, you said this, so I hope that there's a lot of truth to this. Uh, you said you've been helping people for years. Now you're just doing it online for the first time. If that's the case, then I think everything you're doing is good. If that's not the case, then my concern is, is that you probably should have just jumped in and started coaching people first because writing a book and doing these things without being clear about what people struggle with, what they value, what they'd like to hear more about, what they'd like to hear less about, um, it's taking a chance that all these things are going to work for you. Um, it all starts with the prospect. Everything starts with the prospect. And, you know, if, uh, if you don't have that nailed, everything becomes increasingly more difficult, less likely, more haphazard, and more random. If you understand what, who your prospects are, 
right? Um, then it dictates how, like, they need to be spoken to and what needs to be said in order to get them to move, right? If I'm talking to my mother and asking her to take a picture and send it to me, I'm going to talk differently and I'm going to have to explain things differently than if I'm talking to my daughter. Why do you think it's any different when you're talking to your prospects if you don't know who they are? They are different. And if you don't know what that difference is, you're, you're that Craig, like that's where the challenge is. Um, trying to do too much in the beginning, unless you have that experience, like I said. Uh, Rich, who could you say is the best copywriter and marketer in 2021? I don't know that you could say like there's a specific best marketer or best copywriter. There are copywriting styles that go in and out of, there are different types of like, there are different kinds of sales letters at Agora, okay? And they're like a systems letter, a secrets letter, a, you know, there are these different types. I'm not a copywriter there. So, you know, I'm not, I just know this from having spent a lot of time there, but um, and a certain type will come into favor, meaning that that type works incredibly well in the current environment. I learned this from Joe Schrieffer. Um, So Joe is telling me that you really can't tell whether someone's really a great copywriter until that has changed, like what happens to be in favor, and that person is able to dominate a, or do really well in a second, in a different, when, in a different era, not era because it's periods are not like super long or anything, but when a different style is best, because like one time I was asking Joe about Evaldo and, um, I was like, you know, is Evaldo like that? Like Evaldo is one of the best copywriters at Agora. So we were talking about him. Evaldo is a friend of mine as well. And, um, I was saying like how great of a copywriter is or in comparison to other people. And he's like, well, you, I can't really tell you that yet. As far as being able to write this type of promo, he's probably the best. But there have been many times where there have been people like this at Agora. And then when the trend changes, they're not able to do anywhere near as well when they write those kinds of promos. So that, so that, like, because of that, it's really hard, right? Then I'd also say, like, on the marketing front, um, there are people that are really, really good at selling people what it is that they want. Um, then there are people who are really good at selling people to things, selling people things that up until they interacted with that marketing, they didn't think they wanted. So I would say like, for me personally, I am, I don't know that I'm the best cause I don't even know who else does it these days, but I was certainly one of the best and certainly still, I think I'm one of the best. At, be, at being able to market something that the prospect does not believe they want, right? Like when I wrote the Internet Business Manifesto, nobody wanted business coaching. That was why I was the only online business coach. When I wrote uh, The Entrepreneurial Emergency in 2008 and introduced the Internet Marketing Community to Theory of Constraints back in 2008, 13 years ago, nobody knew anything about Theory of Constraints. It came from manufacturing. They probably didn't want to know it, but I got you know, thousands of people to spend 2000 bucks to learn theory of constraints. Right. So I think I'm one of the best marketers of being able to sell things that people inherently don't think they want, but I will make a connection to, I will be able to channel their desire into demand for the product, but I don't hold a candle to a lot of the marketers out there that are better than me at selling what people want. I know how to sell things that people don't want upfront. So because of that, it's very hard to say. I would say that like if I were to, if I'm advertising on native advertising, I want James Von Ellswick to be doing the native advertising for me. If I'm doing something in e-commerce, I want Nick Shackelford to be running my media. If I'm doing something, uh, if I'm doing a webinar, I want to have Jason Fladline write that webinar. If I'm running Facebook traffic, I probably want Maxwell Finn running that traffic. If I like, so the people that are in Steal Our Winners, not all of them, but a very large majority of them are who I believe are the best in each category. 
And that's why they're there. That's why I'm curious to learn from them. That's why they know what's latest and greatest in that dimension. So, um, yeah, really hard. You know, I would say maybe certainly when it comes to nutraceuticals and things like that, um, Craig Clemens would be would rank right towards the very top as far as copywriters. But, you know, um, not sure. Like there's so many good copywriters from John Carlton to Craig Clemens to uh, Evaldo to the Halperts to, you know, my late mentor um, and so many other people. Clayton Maypiece, you know, et cetera. Okay. Um, let's see. Good call on the coaching answer. Thank you. You're welcome, Craig. Uh, what keeps them up at night? Exactly. How is the coming of Strategic Profits to Brazil, Rich? Haven't heard of it yet. Made no progress. The company that Agora was a partner of, that then they bought Agora out, that was the company that was going to be licensing my material. And... Um, the woman who was in charge, she just left the company and she, like without her there, I don't even know what direction they're going in. And so now it's like they bought out Agora, this woman left. So I have no contact with that company anymore. And so now I have nobody in Brazil. I am very open to having someone in Brazil and uh, would like to be involved with someone who already has an info business, ideally, or knows the info business. Um, so... Yeah, if you know anyone, Renan, there'll be a finder's fee. That's for damn sure. Uh, I recently became a follower of your work and kudos for the Hidden Obstacles ebook. I did answer all the questions in it, but I still find myself procrastinating at times. Get the company built to the point of launching. And thanks for the explanation of challenges versus webinar. My question is, I have written two ebooks. I am struggling with whether I offer them both on a lead magnet page for free or just one of them and sell the other as an intro that they get after the free one in exchange. Well, so Craig, let me first tell you that like, I think you're worrying about things that are somewhat inconsequential. So let's start there. Um, and so that worry or concern is really slowing you down. I'd also say that like, that's, that shouldn't even be something that you're considering. So let's, and let me explain why. If someone is not interested in one ebook, they're not going to be interested in two ebooks. So there's really no reason to offer two on the front page unless they're on very different fields in very different areas. But then even that makes less sense. So I would say that ideally you're just offering one. But let me take a step back from there. And I never, I never liked the statement fail fast because I don't like failing. Like failing to me is, uh, transcends like the moment. Um, but I have no problem with doing things incorrectly at first or doing things wrong fast because I can then change it. You really, Craig, need to recognize that this is an iterative process. Just like, you know, there was this great book, Craig, and I'm sure I even mentioned it in that report, I would imagine, uh, called Little Bets. And it was all about, you know, later on, like Annie Duke came out with a book uh, years later that's kind of the same philosophy. But this book, Little Bets, and they were talking about comedians and uh, like, you know, a comedian gets a gig for an HBO special. They don't go down into their basement and then practice for the next eight months and then kill it on the, on the special. No, they, they, they go from club to club to club testing out stuff. And then with their notebook and they write it down, like when they get a good laugh and they change things that don't. And so it's an iterative process. By the time that they get to their comedy special, they've told each of those jokes so many times in so many different ways. They've cut out all the fat. Like it is an iterative process, right? So, like there's after you write an ebook, you got to get it out there as soon as it's done. There's no reason to then put it on a shelf and then write a second one. And 
the reason for that is, is that when you put that first one out, you're going to get back more information than anything else. Like you, you always learn the most from your experience, which you're depriving yourself of right now. No, no feedback, no lesson, no learning will be more valuable than your own experience teaches you because it's the most real and it's the most proximate, right? So like you are robbing yourself of that information. You would have written a different second ebook had you released the first one and there had been anything. If it didn't sell at all, you'd be like, or no one was downloading it, you'd want to know why. And then that would take you down a direction that might have nothing to do with the ebook. If people were reading it and begging you for more, and like, then maybe you'd write the, the second one the same way that you just already did. But like, it is it, like, do your work in public, right? Put stuff out there more frequently. Um, nowadays, when you create a great piece of content, it's 10% the content, and then it's 90% of the time promoting that content, right? Because just creating a piece of content, most of the world is never going to see it. Because most of the world is never going to see it, you don't have to stress about doing your work in public. It's hard enough to get people's attention. So don't be concerned that when you're not even trying really hard to get people's attention, all of a sudden everyone's going to come to a conclusion about you. You're not that important. You're not the center of their attention. They will forget about you the minute they click off the page. So you must like, like you got to like transcend that. And this is online. So there's let you, all you can, like, I'm an introvert. I like put me in a room. Like I'm, I'm shy. Like I don't even like walking over to someone I don't know and introducing myself, but this is online. Like I'm completely safe here, protected in my little room here. And so you have nothing like you guys right now could hate me. You could be all throwing tomatoes at your computer screen or cursing me. And I would have no idea. And I, I wouldn't know. And if you wrote horrible things and please don't, but if you did right, like that would be there, but like, who's reading that and how often and like, what's the big deal? So I think you just got to get over this concern about possibly making a mistake or something to that effect or that you don't know enough or something else. You got to get out there. You learn by doing these days. Action creates clarity. And like there is no you, th there are no five year plans that don't change anymore. This is not like the world that we live in today. The world is accelerating. It is more uncertain than ever before. And the only thing that you can bank on is that you will always learn from your experience. It's win or learn as Conor McGregor's coach, John Kavanaugh's book title is win or learn, win or learn, right? Uh, great stuff. Makes lots of sense. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I have a podomedic, a podomedic as a brand. I don't even know what that means. Better than arithmetic. Okay. Oh, I remember. Okay. My name. I think uh, my name awareness has to come first. That made me think rich. Cool. Uh, Gene Carlo is AI. I just uh, changed my chat name because of you, Rich. Cool. <laughs> uh, hey, Rich, you seem like you are great at making connections. Well, I am great at making connections, as was pointed out to me by my team, from a standpoint that... It's really important to me that that one I keep what I what I say to people all the time like who work for me we keep our side of the street clean. It doesn't matter what's going on on their side of the street. We keep our side of the street clean like we always live up to what we say, right? Like that's first. But also like it is my deepest desire that based on what I said at the beginning of this live stream, right, about your two deaths, that anyone and everyone that I come into contact with is better off because they've come into contact with me. And no one is worse off. Now, no one can live up to that 100%, um, but that's my goal. So, like, for example, even today, um, we let someone go the other day. 
and not anyone that people would know. So no need for me to mention the person's name. And Matt was saying, like, you know, it just wasn't right for what the position was with this person, but we might want to hire him back at some point, whatever. And I was like, oh, OK, well, I'm like, can I help him? Like, do we need to help him? Like, can I does he need does he need me to get him another job? Does he need me to like and why would I do that? Because that person came into my world and I want anyone who comes into my world to leave feeling better off that they came into my world. Um, and so that's one. And I always try and think of like how to make things a win-win. And I think probably to a fault, right? And some of that has to do with my dad, right? You know, one of the very last conversations I had with him before he passed away was him telling me that like, you know, when he looks at me, he recognizes that he like, he didn't understand me because he's like, for me, like him, right? For me, when I'm sitting across from someone, I'm trying to figure out how to get all the money that's in their pocket into my pocket. But I get the sense that that's not the way you operate or the way you think. That's my dad, right? Um, and I'm like, yeah, it's not at all. Like, that's not what I'm thinking about. And um, so, you know, we have these things, right? Where we don't want to be like, like, I'm not going to be like mom. I'm not going to be like dad. Like, I have that to a fault. I don't want to be like dad. Dad took advantage of a lot of people, in my opinion. Um, and made some people a lot worse off, I would think, but whatever. Uh, so it's that. So I think that I am given a chance. I make a great connection, but, uh, but people have to be willing. And at this point now my reputation precedes me. So it makes it a lot easier. Um, but you know, one of the things I tell contributors of steal our winners when I talk, you know, every time is like, especially new ones is like. I want you to understand that I'm a resource for you, that no matter what challenge you have in your business, no matter what obstacle, no matter what issue, no matter what opportunity, if there's anything you need, if you tell me about it, by the time we talk next, I will have answers for you because I talk to way too many people and way too many people give me way too much insight into what's currently going on. That it's if I ask a question on your behalf, I will get an answer. I will find the right person and I will have that person for you. And one of the things, April, that I know I've mentioned on some of these live streams, but it's one of my favorite things to do. And I don't do it like with even the intention of my own profit, but it happens anyway. Like, OK, so I have. As I was saying earlier, like about, I mentioned James Von Ellswick when it comes to native media, native advertising. Okay. So James is a close friend of mine. But before James was a close friend of mine, I was a fan of James. And when I met James, like I knew how good he was. I had watched his presentations, I had read some of his stuff, et cetera. So, like, the first thing I wanted to do was bring him into Agora. So now I, I brought him into Agora, right? And he's super thankful because now he's making hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars extra because of it. And Agora is thankful to me because finally they got someone really, really good for native. Right. So I win in bo like both James feels like he owes me a favor and Agora feels like he owes me a favor. I've put James in touch with a bunch of people, my friend, David, right. My friend, Michael, and Michael calls me and thanks me. David calls me and thanks me. James calls me both times and thanks me. So I like that is my natural nature, though. If I go get a massage tonight and it's ecstatic, like it's amazing when I have friends over on Saturday for the like Conor McGregor fight, I will be telling everyone about this great massage I had. Like I like to share great things, right? Like anything I experience, et cetera. Right. So but especially in business. I've consistently championed people like I'm like I'm champion, champion, championing Troy Erickson right now. Like whenever I talk to a friend of mine that has a big email list, I'm like, hey, I know a guy that uh, will guarantee inbox placement for seventy five hundred dollars. And uh, do you want me to put him in touch with you? And 
you know, whenever I talk to someone who has a big email list, they're like, hell yeah, because they understand and appreciate that. I was talking to John Asaroff. Uh, Asaroff, uh, was it yesterday? It was either yesterday or the day before. Um, he was telling me what he's planning on doing and what they're working on. And I was like, hey, I have really good guys who can get you ranked in YouTube. Do you want me to put them in touch with you? And he's like, I'd love that, right? Then I went to Vincenzo, sent a text to him and Asaroff, like meet each other, blah, blah, blah. And then Vincenzo is super happy with me because he's like, oh, thank you for putting me in touch with John Asaroff, right? John Asaroff is happy once, once Vincenzo gets him ranked number one for one of those videos, John will call me and be like, holy crap, dude, I had no idea. And I'll be like, yeah, that's how it works, right? Like if I make a recommendation, like I'm recommending the best. Um, so a lot of that happens that way, April. And, uh, you know, my ex-wife used to dis like, if we went to a great restaurant, I would tell everyone about it. If we went to like anything good, I would tell everybody. And my ex-wife was always like, why do you have to share everything? Like, right. But that's just what makes me happy. Uh, yes, I talk over and over in my book about serving others is the only path. So we are on the same page. The title of the book is the nonstop entrepreneur which is kind of ironic since you're kind of stuck. Uh, I have started several companies, so I thought, why not me? Comes out later this month, be available on Amazon, hint, hint. But as mentioned, this is my first foray into digital online only, but I had not thought of coaching prior to launching the biz. Hmm, thanks for the answer, Rich. My pleasure. Uh, wouldn't Anibal be a good fit, good contact in Brazil? I think that he has expressed an interest. Uh, no, he hasn't really expressed an interest. And right now he's building a company with Ivaldo. Um, but when it's an appropriate time, I'm sure he'll bring it up. I mean, I do talk to him from time to time. So uh, if it's right, he'll bring it up. Boom. Now Brunson and ClickFunnels next Crabtree and <laughs> Uh I guess I just became a natural writer nowadays and I need to get it out of me. No, I mean, it's great writing if you're putting that writing out in the world. Like a lot of, like there have been countless people who've written their book on their blog and got feedback all the way through, right? Like there's just so many ways that you can do that in public and you'd be better off for it. Uh, I'm not going to waste tomatoes when I get all that juice out of the keyboard, Greg. So I get it. Do your work public, priceless. It's a really good book, I think, do your work, or it's not, you know, my words. Um, as I can, and I can see your point 100% on getting it out there right away to determine if you have something worth a shit. Excuse my French. Uh, n don't be at all. Um, you know, I mean, there is a case to like make time for greatness, but you finished the first book. So they're like, and you have a second book already finished. So you've already made the time for greatness, hopefully. And now it's about getting it out. Things don't get generally things don't get better over time. Uh, sorry if I'm taking up too much space or not, but this is awesome hearing from you directly and getting this insight. Online marketing is a space I have studied for years, but now I'm trying to make it my reality. The way you make it a reality, Craig, is you start. Start anywhere. Start with anything. Sell someone's product on ClickBank. Do something. Anything. Right? You got to dive in. Like one of the things, Craig, that I used to like have my clients do is outsource a project for like a piece of software that would just specifically to make their life easier, just something like it could be a $5 or $10 piece of software, a script that does one thing on their computer, but it's something they consistently do. I could give a crap about what it was. I just wanted them to get the experience of outsourcing. I wanted them to spec something out. I wanted them to get something back. I wanted them to be like, oh, this isn't anything to be scared of. And now in this little way, my life is a little bit easier. I can see that as an entrepreneur, all I'm really doing is moving resources and figuring out ways to kind of grease the slide so the resources get into the people's hands that want them, need them, you know, et cetera. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's no difference between an online business and an offline business as far as running them. Um, you know, when I was, when I had my clothing store, right, I didn't design the clothes. I didn't sew the clothes. I didn't sell the clothes. I didn't ring up the clothes. I didn't stock the shelves. I didn't do any of those things. I ran the business with the hypnosis business. I started out as the hypnotist and the salesperson. 
But eventually I just was running the hypnosis business and growing the hypnosis business, right? I do not like we've used Infusionsoft at Strategic Profits since 2006. I have I do not know how to send an email, never have. In the 15 years that we've owned uh we've used infusion i don't know how to don't know how to send an email i don't know how to create a page on click funnels i don't know any of those things when i started i used front page used autoresponder plus i mean you know i used aweber and one shopping cart was a client of mine but like i never learned any of the things that because that's not how the business at the end of the day makes money now you might have to do those things in the beginning but understand that business is business Uh, do you think the term business consultant versus business coach is out of sync with today's lingo? I think they're, you know, it depends on the market, right? I mean, nowadays there's coaches, coach, coaches, coach, coaches, right? Um, everybody and their brother wants to be a coach. Um, but consultant, you know, uh, I, I consider myself a coach cause I tend to work with entrepreneurs. Um, when I've done like the teaching for Google or Yahoo or Microsoft or my work with Agora, that's more of a consulting gig. I'm not really coaching. Um, so it, who you are speaks louder than you, who you say you are. Right. Uh, who did Jay Abraham and Dan Kennedy learn from? Uh, well, Jay originally his first download, so to speak was from, uh, Dan Rosenthal and uh, Dan Rosenthal also owned the ad agency that Gary Benzavenga started at. Uh, he also owned the agency that Clayton Makepeace got his experience. At, 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 at. Rosenthal influenced Jay Abraham, influenced Clayton Makepeace, influenced Gary Benzavenga. Um, Jay Abraham influenced Mark Ford. And Bill Bonner, much more Mark Ford, but Mark Ford is what who brought all of Jay's stuff to Agora. Um, so it all starts with Dan Rosenthal, and um, I don't know who precedes him. Uh, Dan Kennedy, when he was a teenager, worked at Halberts, which was a direct mail house. Gary's coat of arms letter was working at that time. And so they had people opening envelopes with money in it 24 seven, three shifts. Um, and, uh, but I don't know where Kennedy really learned copywriting from whether he was self-taught or not, but he, he has a book and I never read it and I really should. I have it. My unfinished business with the, which is his biography or autobiography. Does the Gore still offer affiliate relationships? Yes, they do. Uh, you are so great, bro. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, which begs the question, do you offer affiliate relationships? Hell yeah, we do. And we love our affiliates. Uh, love that super connector. Yeah. But a super connector in a way that doesn't like th I've met a few connectors, right? And like, I don't like dealing with them because I'm always afraid that like, they're going to call me with a favor at some point. I'm not going to want to do, but they did something for me and now I'm going to feel obligated. So like, I'm not a professional connector, right? I am someone who gets great enjoyment out of connecting to people and seeing something happen that wasn't going to happen. You know, this uh, Tracy Goss, who wrote the last word on power, who was a protege of Werner Erhard. What, she wrote the last word on power and she was writing about leadership and it's one of my favorite definitions of leadership. Um, she said, a leader uh, makes a future happen that was not going to happen anyway. Right? You don't need a leader for a future that was going to happen anyway. It's going to happen. So the only thing, uh, the reason you like, the, the reason of for, for a leader is to make a future happen that was not going to happen anyway. So when I introduce two people, that we're never going to meet and then they do business together and it kicks ass. I am making a future happen. That was not going to happen anyway. And I get off on that. Like I really enjoy making things happen 
that were not going to happen anyway, and that positive, and it's a positive thing that's happening. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, correct that other than being a one man band, I have to learn all the angles and apps to use. I have to build the funnels, write the copy and content. Maybe my book will sell enough to provide a little extra capital. We'll see. It all comes down to the way you sell it, right? It has less to do with the book and more about how you sell the book, they, you know, on how well it sells. Uh, yes, I hate caving into new lingo. Oh, don't even get me started on that stuff. Get a pass. Uh, thank you, Rich, for doing these streams. My pleasure, Ben. Me too. I'm a connector. How do I monetize that? Werner Erhard Est is a fraud. Werner is not a fraud. I uh, love her definition of a leader. And another one I love is that a leader creates other leaders. Yeah, that's kind of like, but that's circular, right? Like this is very like precise. What have you made happen that was not going to happen anyway? Uh, a lot of people kind of let their lives like kind of lead them. And uh that is a mistake. So we didn't even get a chance to really get into this whole reputation thing. I mean, I guess some of the questions that I was answering kind of were along those lines, but, you know, definitely want to spend a bunch more time here because like, uh, the, wait, where was I going with this? Oh, uh, you know, it's something I shared in other live streams, but on other topics, not this one. Um, Gary Halpert said this to me, and uh, and it's only over time that I've seen how wise it really was. He said, Rich, uh, people will buy from you because of what you promise them, but they only stick around if they like you, right? People will buy from you based on what you promise them, but they only stick around if they like you. Right. So having this reputation, like understanding which parts of your personality are the like the powerful parts um, is not only about making things happen that weren't going to happen anyway. It's also it's not only about opening doors for you and stuff like that. It's also what gets people to stay in programs. It gets people to stay in relationship with your business. Um, there's a lot of truth to that. And. Like it boggles my mind, but this is, this is the world we live in, right? There is no core, like Agora's primary number one, like product line is investment newsletters. We've got a lot of them, right? You don't do billions of dollars a year without selling a lot of them. There is zero, zero correlation between the performance of the recommendations that the guru makes and the renewals of subscriptions. So you would think, right, that if a guru's newsletter made one, one prediction after another that all turned out to be like five baggers, right? Hold on one second. It's my daughter and my girlfriend's out of town, so I got to just make sure she's okay. Hey, baby, I'm on a live stream. Is everything okay? Okay, call me in like I'll be done in 30 minutes or text me. Okay, love you. Bye. Um, the okay, can I try? Oh, um, the where was I going? Jesus, what was I just talking about? Totally um, lost my train of thought. Oh, retention. I know maybe something happened. Damn it. Maybe someone can tell me. Uh, what are the ways you sell your books? If I may ask, I don't sell my books. I mean, I have a few on Amazon that were reports, so I don't really like to think of them as books. And the only two books that I have out are, I have a book, 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 I have a book. Uh, this book with, book with, book with, book with, book with. The thing I've really written are a bunch of reports. Uh, you are not, I'm an advocate of Werner Erhard and everything that Werner's ever created because I believe in the concepts of him. Like, I believe in Heidegger. I believe in Wittgenstein. I believe in Nietzsche. And these were the, the people that he pulled from to build what he built. So the all the fundamentals that Est and Landmark are based on, I buy into. I believe in the ontological, right, um, approach. And yeah too long of a story 
red flag. If it's a red flag for you, then it's a red flag for you. I am who I am, right? Uh, book funnel, lead magnet, all of the above. Book funnel, if you happen to be a member of Steel Our Winners, Craig, uh, Russell Brunson went over the single best funnel that he's ever created that is a book funnel that he spends over a million dollars a month on cash flow positive that has been more responsible for growing click funnels than any other funnel. Um, he goes over that in steal our winners. And, uh, if you don't have access to that, then I would say go to click funnels, find a book funnel on that side of Russell's and copy that. But you want, yeah, you want a book funnel. I don't know if you can do free plus shipping and handling on Facebook anymore. They sometimes want you to now make the book paid and do free shipping and handling, which is nowhere near as good from a marketing angle. But uh, yeah, people who have book funnels swear by them. Uh, hi, Rich. I joined CLR Winners Life Membership. Thanks for being my mentor. Well, thank you, Sarah. And I look forward to talking to you in person during one of the coaching calls that you avail yourself to and about people liking you. I don't know. No, you said it's a red flag. So if it's a red flag, like run away from me, red flag, then do so. People buy from you from what you promise, but they stick around because they like you. Exactly. And what you're selling is essential, important. Well, I'd like to believe so. Now, that is Scientology that does that. S no longer exists. Uh, just saw a dent in the universe on Amazon. Would it be possible for you guys to upload it to SOW? It should be an SOW. Yeah, don't buy it. Don't buy it. We should, we have to figure out a place for those. So yes. Any advice on a launch? Tons of advice for a launch, David, but it, you're joining us a little late and I have no idea what you want to launch. But um, if you join me next Tuesday, right? It's Thursday. Yeah. If you join me on Tuesday and ask me that question and tell me kind of launch and what advice you're looking for, I'd be glad to help you. Tell me about steal our winners. Uh, best thing I can say is, is that it's strategies and tactics that are currently crushing it that the world doesn't know about. We give you the strategies and tactics that won't appear in a course for quite a period of time when they're most effective, where you have to do the least to make the most. Um, and we have over a hundred contributors and that contributor list is always growing as I'm always keeping my eyes out for other people that are at the edge. And, um, yeah, that's kind of it. But if you want Craig, what I really would suggest is join our Facebook group. It's completely free. It's called strategic profits in there. You'll see some of my free reports and, uh, from there you can find out more about steal our winners and everything else. How to deal with ADD and doing business. I'm all over the place. Um, always use a timer. Got to always use a timer, Hamza. And you, you stick to that one thing while you're using that timer. The other thing is uh, break your projects up into many, many projects. This way you have the fun of jumping from thing to thing, but you're still moving the overall goal forward. In other words, you get the feeling of multitasking, but you're still single tasking. And... Uh, like, I think uh, those are some of the easy ones. Um, meditation certainly helps. It's an issue with concentration, but, you know, I wouldn't trade my ADD for anything. Like, the ability to hyper-focus is one of my, it's like one of the most important things that have gotten me to where I am. Uh, thanks for, my pleasure, man. Uh, hidden obstacles was great report. Thanks, Craig. I just discovered you. You were great. Read your manifesto. Oh, wow. Cool. You know, it was written 15 years ago, just to let you know. Uh, anyway. All right. So let me play like just a few minutes of what I was planning on playing the whole time. And then we'll see if it's even worth uh, revisiting. So uh, let's say we'll play this for like five or 10 minutes. Then I'll turn this off. We'll talk a little bit more for a few minutes and then we'll call it a night. So let's do it. Welcome to the Expert Guru Series. Throughout this series, I'll be sharing with you my secrets for massive market influence so that you ultimately get paid for who you are rather than simply what you do. In other words, that your reputation precedes you and causes you to earn more simply because of who you are, as opposed to the vast majority that only get paid for their output, what they do. Now, this series is going to contain four modules. 
Module one is where I'm going to talk to you about developing the mindset of a guru so that you can start actually thinking like a guru and therefore start becoming a guru. In module two, I'm going to walk you through the steps to carve out your niche in your specific market so that you can become the leading authority, the chief influencer in your field. In module three, I'm going to show you how to develop your voice as a guru in your speaking, in your writing, on video, in audio, in every format that you choose to communicate with your audience. I will show you how to cultivate that voice that will give others confidence in following your advice and buying and paying for your services. And in module four, we're going to take everything that we cover and we're going to transform it into your very own action plan to take you to the very top of your market in the shortest amount of time with the highest degree of certainty. So we've got a lot to cover. So let's dive in. Now, this is module number one, which, as I said, is the guru's mind, adopting the mindset of a market influencer. You see, successful people do simple things that unsuccessful people don't do because they don't recognize that it really matters. These things that we'll be covering today and in the future modules do in fact matter. And I wanna make sure that you recognize that so that even these little insignificant things you don't overlook because just because they appear to not matter much, they actually do. And they matter more than you could realize right now but that's why you're listening to this. That's why you're watching this so that you can understand what are these little things that matter the most. Now, along those lines, my goal for you in this module is to really get you to think like a guru so that by the time we're through with this, you will understand exactly how a guru thinks, what a guru does, and how a guru uses their own insights to give themselves a competitive advantage in their market. So in order for us to do that, to actually get you thinking like a guru. Here's what we'll be covering today. First, we'll cover a fundamental truth about being an online guru that you must understand if you're going to be successful online. Next, we'll look at the road that I traveled myself to become the guru of the gurus so that you can see how someone can make the leap from being completely unknown, a nobody you could say, to becoming the top guru with the top positioning. Then we'll look at what I call the multi-million dollar mindset of a guru so that you can understand exactly what a guru does, how a guru thinks, something that you must understand if you're going to be a guru yourself. Then we'll cover how to create your own mindset as a guru so that you can develop the insights that will potentially make you rise to the top of your market faster than you can ever imagine. After that, we'll look at a concept I call thinking like an artist and acting like a guru, which can help you when you're developing your own mindset and pushing you forward through many of the mental obstacles that hold far too many back and stand in their way of achieving this top influence, this top authority in their market. Next, we'll cover something that plagues every new entrepreneur, and that's fear. And we'll look at how to overcome your fears quickly so you can get past them and reach the success goals that you're after in the fastest way possible. Then we'll look at how to outthink your flaws so that you can easily bypass the negative parts of your own personality that would keep your business from thriving. And then finally, we'll look at a couple of mental shortcuts to deeper thinking so that you can literally outthink your competition and therefore outperform your competition and therefore out earn your competition. And then we'll wrap it up today with some action items so that you can take the information and advice that I give you here and put it to your own use as quickly and as immediately as possible, and therefore start reaping the rewards as quickly as possible. Now, we called this webinar series Expert to Guru because taking that leap to being the top guru in your industry is the fastest way to take your online business to the next level. It's the most strategic way to set yourself apart from your competitors and eventually fulfill your dreams of running a successful online business and living the lifestyle that you want. So I want to start off this webinar series with a fundamental truth that all top gurus in the world know and use to their advantage. And it's something that you need to understand as you move from being an expert to becoming a guru. You see, if you're going to rise to the top of your industry and truly influence your market, you're going to need more than just being a successful entrepreneur. You're going to need to be more than just a run-of-the-mill expert. You see, you need to set yourself up as a guru. And a guru is much more than just an expert. You see, an expert is simply knowledgeable about a particular topic, but a guru has the expertise and is also recognized as the leading authority in their field. So they have the ability to influence their market. 
So therefore, you can see that expertise alone never makes a guru. And many people assume that if they just simply learn enough, they will eventually have the influence in their market. But life doesn't work that way. In fact, you could study forever. You could learn absolutely everything there is to know about your particular field and still not be recognized by anyone, have no influence, and ultimately be a nobody in your market. The reason is no one else knows that you have your insights, that you have your expertise in your particular field unless you make everyone aware of it unless you broadcast that fact, and that's where marketing comes in. You see, the fundamental truth is this. In addition to expertise, any recognized guru in their field, in their industry, in their market, knows how to market themselves as an authority, knows how to market themselves as a guru, a maven. You see, they have learned to think of themselves as a guru and then been able to communicate that idea to their marketplace. You see, it wasn't some lucky or fortunate experience that ever leads anyone to being a guru. They marketed their way to where they are today. And that's good news for you because you don't want to follow in the footsteps of someone who just happened to get there by accident. You don't want to mimic an accident. You want to mimic a clear path that's been proven to get others to the spot that you want to attain. And that's what we're covering here. You want to follow a strategic approach that gets you to the very top of your market. Let me give you some examples. Dan Kennedy, for example, is probably not the best copywriter in the world, but he's an exceptional marketer. So many people perceive him to be the best or at least one of the best copywriters. Or how about Dr. Phil? Dr. Phil is one of the most celebrated mental health professionals in the world. But there's a reason for that. He knew how to market himself with his personality. How about me? I'm known as the guru to the gurus because I've helped more gurus build businesses online than anyone else. Now, I didn't come up with that, but once someone else said that about me, I started using it and I've been marketing myself as the guru to the gurus for years. So much so that often that is how people refer to me or introduce me when I get on stage. So the truth is that While being a guru and being the top influencer in your market does start with expertise, that expertise must be coupled with marketing because marketing and self-appointment, self-aggrandizement is how you become a guru. Think about how you want other people to see you. Think about what they would need to perceive about you to be willing to pay for your advice and then start marketing yourself that way. Now, As I just mentioned, a certain amount of self-aggrandizement is a part of becoming a guru. You will always be the first person to brand yourself as a guru, as an authority. It doesn't happen by accident, and no one's going to come around and tell the world that you're a guru unless you first have done it yourself. See, after that, it's up to you to market yourself that way so that peers start seeing you as the guru of your industry. And my main point is that it has to be deliberate, that you have to figure out how you want to be perceived and then do what you can to be perceived the way you believe your market needs to perceive you in order to follow you. Take, for example, I just recently met with an up and coming guru who was planning to do a launch and they were asking me about how do they really get to the top? And my question to them was, well, How do you want to be perceived in the market? And he said that he was doing this launch and that he would wait and see what people thought of him after the launch was done. And my response was, is that that's completely backwards, that you want to start figuring out how you want to be perceived before you do your launch. Then when you do your launch, you put a paragraph of copy that defines your positioning in all the swipe files that you create for your affiliates. This way, the entire internet is being alerted of your positioning with each and every email that gets put out. And I wanna really underscore that point. You see, too many people believe that this is something that happens accidentally. And because of that, they sit on the sidelines and they never achieve the positioning that they desire or the positioning that would really boost their income. So what I'm telling you here is, A simple fact 
that if you wait for it to happen, it will never happen. That you have to broadcast to the world who you are. Nope. So that's the, I was going to play that tonight. I think having watched a few minutes of it, um, the, I think it is well worthwhile. So I think we will, you know, we'll start how we started today, but then we'll go back to playing this. I'll sit on the side and then make comments uh, throughout. But I would also say that um, one of the things that, is one of the, it's one of the easiest ways to kind of drill it down. It's not the person with the most expertise that dominates the market. It's the one who knows how to market that expertise that dominates the market. If you have a choice between the expertise like coaching or the ability to market coaching, it's the ability to market coaching that that person will dominate the field much more so than the best coach. And that's incredibly important, right? Like Dan Kennedy tells stories and I experienced the same thing. So he's a hundred percent right that like at hypnosis conventions, everybody there was like doing techniques on one another. Like that's the most exciting thing, like getting better at the craft. It's the person that's able to market the craft that always dominates. So I'm not saying not don't get good at your craft. I mean, you should. But but while you're getting good at your craft, you should be paying attention to the fact that you got to sell this. And like, what are the things that makes this immensely sellable? And unfortunately, most people don't get that. The reason I was like, the reason I was as successful as a coach as I was, especially in the beginning, right? I didn't have the track record I have now, um, was my ability to market that coaching the market didn't even want it in the beginning. So that's my, the, this is it's self anointed and it has to be manufactured and you have to be really good at marketing the thing that you do. And that if you, it would not be unreasonable to say that, an equal amount of time you spend on your craft, you should spend on marketing your craft. And the reason I don't sound like that is because that's me stream of consciousness talking off of notes and then an editor coming in. And what you'll notice is that there were no ums, there were no ands, there were no pauses, there were none of those things. Hence why I want to do these live streams and then have videos created from it because I can sound crisp and clean and tight that way, but talking that way on a very consistent basis is quite challenging for me. So I choose not to do that. In fact, I much want to focus rather on the message I'm communicating much more so than how I package the message. If I started thinking about all those kinds of things, it would just make this a lot less fun for me. Um, so anyway, let me just see what you have to say here and then we will call it a night guys okay but i i think we should play more of that i think it, it it is very on topic and i think i have probably forgotten some of those things in there and uh yeah let's see and totally agree that dr phil owes oprah a whole lot whole lot, whole lot, whole lot, whole lot, whole lot whole be clear about that right oprah was a client of dr phil's one of the one thing that you've heard me consistently do tonight, right, is have marquee clients. Who are the clients that if you had in your market, people would be like, oh, 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 do you know what I mean? So marquee clients is an extremely effective strategy. I've written about that numerous times. It's one of the reasons why I have so many marquee clients is a extremely effective strategy at positioning yourself in a certain way, right? You know, the dentist that handles all the supermodels or movie stars, the, you know, the, these are all like, we just naturally assume that they're getting the best of the best. So this person must be 
great because these people rely on their looks and they have the money to get the best. So like, think about who in your market, if you had as a customer, would make all the difference. And so, yes, Dr. Phil certainly owes Oprah, but understand Dr. Phil owes Oprah. I owe uh, Mike Filsane, Russell Brunson, all these guys, they like, you know, I coach and they help become uber successful and now they make me look good, right? Um, so same difference. Uh, is there a difference between the word maven and guru? Yeah, guru is more like a source of knowledge. Maven is more like a connector, but they go, but they're synonymous in certain ways. But like, that's the real difference. A maven is someone you go to, like, you know, like, I don't have to be a guru to do steal our winners, but I do have to be a maven. I have to be connected to everyone, right? What maybe helps me ans ask better questions of those, of the gurus that I'm, I, I'm talking to is that the fact that I'm a guru as well with experience in the field. But all I would really need to be is a maven to do steal our winners and conduct those interviews because that is the person that knows what's going on in that neighborhood, in that niche. A swipe file is a file full of other people's promotions that were effective that you can use as templates, as outlines, as sources of inspiration, et cetera. Uh, mastering yourself is key. No one else thinks you're a guru unless you believe in it first. Yeah, and you present yourself that way. Um, cool. I'm out there on LI and FB and Core every day giving thoughtful advice, sometimes so tongue-in-cheek humor. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, yes, play more. Cool, I will. Thank you so much, Rich. That was super valuable. Cool, then I will definitely play more. Uh, I just got, I got SOW yet, haven't started on it. My glass is overflowing. We'll stop buying stuff for a little while then and start consuming. Uh, and recognize that one of the benefits of, if you approach steal our winners the right way, Jonathan, you get, you'll get a tremendous amount out of it. So here's the right way to approach it. Um, go, you should go in knowing what it is you're looking for. Now, what you could, that you can be as precise or general as need be. The more precise, the better, right? Like I'm looking for a way to better manage my Facebook ads, okay? Make my ads more, you know, have my ads better performance. Like that might be, that's something more specific. Uh, or it might be I'm looking for a, ideas on how to sell this book. And then based on whatever your level of membership, I would look at the issues and then what's in each issue and what applies to you or not. The next platform, you won't have to do any of that. It'll make it very relevant and easy for you to find. But right now, like you have to go in and then take those and watch, read. So now you've identified the few that matter to you. Then read the one page summary with the action guide and see if it really is applicable to you or not. So you'll then reduce it down to fewer. And then from those, right, either watch all of them and decide, or you can just decide from looking at the strategy documents. Um, the next go in this next release, there will also be time to complete and potential upside. So you'll also have that. But the, but the, the whole idea is that right now, if you're going through courses, unless you're trying to get a lay of the land, which is useful courses like to give you that overall, because what we're going to do in CLR Winners is we're going to give you the best tactics that don't exist in courses today that you will find in courses in a few years from now buried around a lot of conceptual stuff. So if you are overwhelmed and frustrated, right? Well, part of that overwhelm is that you feel like you have a lot to consume. You're frustrated because you're not getting the results you want. What Steal Our Winners provides you is a lot less to consume. One, because you can choose what to consume. And two, because we're only teaching you the tactic and strategy. We're not filling it with anything else. And we're giving it to you when it's not in a course, when it's easiest to get the biggest result. 
So you spend a lot less time, you get exactly what you need, and then you put that into action and you will no longer be overwhelmed and frustrated. So it's not a question of whether you've gotten around to it yet. It's the most important thing once you know what it is you want to do, right? Steal Our Winners is not the place that you figure out like your niche or like the type of business you want, right? You can't be everything to everybody. What we provide are the best tactics that are currently crushing it that the world knows nothing about. Period. That's it. That's like what we do. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, thanks as usual, Rich. You're truly bringing strategic profits and your mission to life, making a real difference to the world. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Renan, and thank you for saying that. Uh, oh, I hope uh, it was not a serious emergency, Dr. Vogelman. Yeah, Oprah does get mad if she, you say she's your customer. Shared four times earlier, Chris, you are the man. I've got no traction on my Marketing Maven Tips Facebook page. May many a file cabinet for stuff I find. All right. Uh, I am a real guru in my industry, but I don't know how to self-anoint manufacturer and marketing myself. Hence, I need help. Well, Sarah, then... Um, you should read the Maven Matrix Manifesto, which you can find online absolutely free. Um, just type it in and do a search. I'm sure there are people giving it away. There are ones that it, there are ones that only have Jay's name on it, but it's the same one. You just had someone else, uh, even though I wrote it. Um, but anyway, um, we collaborated when we talked about it. The but yeah, so I would read that first. Um, that'll give you a really good overview and some simple steps that you can take that will make a difference. It, believe it or not, like for years, they use just that in Agora to position gurus. So it's more than enough. That was actually the problem with that report. I gave away too much, but, um, cause it was one of the free marketing reports. Um, and it's the only free marketing report that I refer people to, to actually do stuff. So, um, yeah, I'd start with that. The Maven Matrix Marketing Manifesto. Um, and uh, because there are certain ingredients you need, Sarah, and, and, and I, I walk you through that in that report. Got it. Thank you. All right, guys. Cool. We are six minutes late, so we'll end here. Um, and I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for being here for commenting, for, for sharing, if you shared, for subscribing, if you subscribed. And, uh, you know, there are many places you could be. Look, you decided to be here. I don't take that for granted. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that for what it does for me. And I appreciate that about what it says about you, that you're where you are is where you don't want to stay and that you're on a path going forward, right? Just like I try to be as well. And we all have ambition and we want to do better, be better. And uh, I salute you for that. And uh, I appreciate you for that. And so thank you. And so with that said, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I know I will have a wonderful weekend. I am so excited about watching Conor McGregor. Um, I am so rooting for him, even though I love Dustin Poirier as well. He's like, he might be my second most favorite fighter. So uh, kind of crazy, but um, yeah, love Conor McGregor and, uh, and the co-main event should be great too. And it's just, I'm having a bunch of friends over, so can't wait. And I'm consuming so much YouTube right now, watching every interview about it, wasting so much time. So thank God Conor doesn't fight that often. And with all that said, I look forward to seeing everyone on Tuesday where we'll pick up this. And uh, until then, to higher profits and beyond, this is Rich Sheffrin over and out.